This is Madison Matthews with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. Today is November 9th at 3.17 p.m. and we are at Jackie's house in Pensacola to interview Jackie Lane for the Pensacola Environmental Oral History Project. I'm joined by my colleagues from the Oral History Program and the Gulf Scholars Program. Jackie, would you please introduce yourself? I am Jackie Lane. Um, I live here on Perdido Bay and have lived here for 50 years, raised uh, five children here. My husband died in 2012, but he was a, a, a collaborator with us. I mean, we fought for the cleaning up Perdido Bay for a long time. And um, let's see, what else? I guess I taught, I taught at uh, various, uh, taught at Penn School uh, Junior College when it was a junior college, state college, and also U UWF, uh, as just as uh, an adjunct because of, well, I, I had all those children. <laughs> that pretty much took a lot of my time. And can you describe your experience growing up near Perito Bay? Pretty Am I saying that correctly? Perdido Bay, Perdido yeah, Perdido, Bay. Uh, lost. It, in Spanish, it's, it means lost, Perdido. Oh, it's been, as you can see, it's a beautiful place. Uh, it's, uh, this, this property belonged to um, my mother and father-in-law. They had accumulated it over the years. Uh, he, uh, my father-in-law was in the military, and, you know, they would come back to Pensacola and buy a few more acres <laughs> on the bay. and. And so over the period of, uh, you know, whatever, 30 years, 40 years, they accumulated this property. And it is gorgeous. It was 25 acres, uh, but it was divided up when, uh, of course, the children, uh, when they died and the children passed away, it was. Uh, and so all I have is this little piece now, of this little piece of heaven. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so how long has your family then been in? Perdido Bay, and what roles have they, like, played in the community? Well, originally we started out in 1986. Uh, my husband and I, we, um, we, we used Perdido Bay every day in the summer. I mean, because the house, which is next, right next door to this, uh, we built, it did not have air conditioning for, <laughs> for 10, or, 10 or 12 years. And so that was my husband's uh, plan. Uh, we would swim in the bay at least twice a day, I'd swim before lunch, or swim before dinner. That was the uh, routine. And so that's what we did. We swam in the bay, and the kids used to fish, and we fished, and they would throw clams at one another. And um, it was just a beautiful, uh, as you can see, a beautiful place to raise children. Um, but over the years, of course, Perdita Bay became worse and worse, and I don't swim anymore. I'm actually, I, about two years ago, I stopped swimming in Perdita Bay because it just, I, I think it's a little dangerous. <laughs> right, and thank you for sharing that. Um, just kind of going back then, um, on your own personal childhood, was there a specific moment or memory that stood out regarding your connection to the local ecosystem? No, not not in particular. I mean, I moved here when when I was, what, 30? Mm -hmm. That was how old I was when I moved here. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is kind of a polluted area as well. <laughs> and, um, I, and of course, I went to school undergraduate school at Miami, which is gorgeous. And um, then I went to uh, the University of uh, South Florida, which is Tampa, that's very nice. And we moved here and uh, I didn't think the weather here was as good as South Florida. It was more humid <laughs> and colder in the winter, but that's the way it is. And, but it's a, a beautiful area because it's, as you can see, it's wooded and peaceful, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, growing up then in the Pittsburgh area and then moving here in your 30s, I'm curious about that time in between. Was there something that prompted you to become an environmental advocate? Not really. Um, I was in the Peace Corps. Uh, after I graduated from the University of Miami, I uh, joined the Peace Corps in Bolivia. 
I went to Bolivia. And um, w while I was in Bolivia, of course, um, I, you know, it was isolated. There was no TV, no phones, no nothing. And a matter of fact, we didn't have electricity or running water. It was pretty much primitive. And I thought how lucky we are here in the United States to have all of this stuff that we have. And these poor little Indians, these poor Bolivian Indians, hardly had anything. Of course, they didn't know the difference. <laughs> and I mean, they were, they were happy, or even though they had huge infant mortality rates and uh, everything. Uh, but, but, I, but the thing about the Peace Corps, which was especially um, interesting, is there was, I mean, you weren't sold anything. Be out of the country and out of the commercial, as the commercial environment that we live in in the United States. There were no ads. There was nothing. I came back to the U.S. and I was just confronted with this, you know, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. I mean, it was like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, I, I realized how much commercially pr commercial pressure people were under in the U.S. And I guess that's that's a, a form of environmentalism right there. <laughs> to realize that you, you know, we are like, oh, wait a minute, we don't need to buy all this stuff. Um, that's it. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And were there any mentors or influential figures in your life who inspired you to pursue that career? Marine biology? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, in a way. My, um, uh, in the summers, we used to come down to Florida. My grandmother had some apartments uh, on Pasigrill Beach, Florida, that's uh, in St. Pete, right at the end of the island. And um, we used to come down, she had apartments there, and we used to come down in the summers and spend a month there. And it was so beautiful. Um, I remember swimming in the Gulf there at the jetty and finding octopus and so forth. And that's, I guess, what prompted me to get to become a marine biologist, I, lo I love this. I love the sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you have a favorite outdoor activity to do, or an activity that's connected to the environment? Well, I just love. I mean, hiking, with hiking, swimming. I mean, this is, you know, we're we always go. My my kids are, are all outdoors people. We hike, we, and so forth. That's, yeah, that's what we do. Visit, visit other areas and hike, you know. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you came from like this really cool experience in the Peace Corps and then went and got, became a marine biologist. So was that, on the timeline of that, were you in the, went in the Peace Corps and then went and became the marine biologist? Um, well, I graduated from the University of Miami mm -hmm. in 1964, went in the Peace Corps for two years, 68, came back and I worked for a year in North Carolina at the um, Bureau of Commercial Fisheries there in, in uh, North Carolina and on the coast, tagged Menhaden. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, um, you know, what I did. I, I went out in the boat and tagged Menhaden. I saw all this stuff, and but I worked with a bunch of PhDs that wouldn't take any of my advice or, <laughs> or anything. And that prompted me to say, well, I'm, I'm going back to graduate school. And that's what I did. Right. <laughs> so what brought you to Pensacola then? Just the family connection or? It was my husband. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband grew up here. His family was in the military. And they, over the period of time, bought this property. And um, I met my husband when I was in graduate school at the University of South Florida. And we all, he always talked about, oh, we've got to move back to Pensacola. We've got to move back. And we finally did. So this is how I came back to Pensacola. And uh, of course, I had never been here. And uh, it was, uh, as I said, the weather didn't impress me at first because it was, seemed hotter in the summer, colder in the winters because of the humidity. But I still, uh, I, I, yeah, I still uh, think it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then when you moved, to Pensacola, was there an immediate, like, did you immediately know about Perdido Bay and the paper mill, 
or was it Not kind of all. a discovery? No, we didn't. We didn't pay much attention at all to the paper mill. I mean, we went swimming, every, you know, every day. Uh, you know, we knew we had to kind of wash off when we got out because there was kind of these fibers got in your your hair, your skin. But we washed off. I mean, we didn't know anything about dioxin and or anything. It wasn't until the clam, my, I'd, I'd been studying clam. I, I did a lot of research in the Bay, actually. And um, I, started, I started studying the clams back in 82, 1982. And in 1986, yep, it was 1986, the clams all came out of the bottom and died. It was a shock. I mean, it was a shock. Well, the water was real dark and murky and nasty. And, and that was be the beginning of really um, my awareness of how polluted the bay was. <laughs> And even the paper mill, we didn't even realize there was actually a paper mill up there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we didn't pay much attention at all to it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd love to hear more kind of along that line. Could you describe your journey to understanding the pollution issues then right here in the Bay? Well, it took a long time. And of course, the pollution issues have changed over, over, over the years. Um, um, but I mean, it took, it took, it took a long time to understand, and I'm still not totally understanding of what's happening. But as you can see, you can look out there and there's nobody out there fishing, <laughs> and the clams are all gone, and the snails I used to study, there are very few of them, and so there's something wrong, and uh, this is what bothers me, and um, so it, it took, it takes, I don't, as I said, I don't completely understand what it is that's wrong with the bay, although I have a, a lot of, yes, I have a lot of, I know what's wrong, but um, there may be other things too, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you don't know all the things that are going into the bay. There, I mean, there's no way people could understand. We do testing, our environmental group does testing, and we test for certain things, but there's just so many other, other chemicals that be going in there are not tested for, you know, they do water quality studies, but that's kind of, you know, sort of, <laughs> kind of, I mean, unless you test for the chemicals, you don't know what, you don't know what happens. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so how has your personal work then as a marine biologist, like overlapped into the work that's being done to like bring awareness to this pollution in the bay? That's a, that's a goldfish. <laughs> they want to eat. <laughs> um, well, I could understand. You know, the thing, the thing is about my training has allowed me to understand things. I mean, I can read scientific papers and, and understand them. Um, and, and so I can maybe, but my, better than a lot of other people, you know, just the r regular layman, it's hard for them to understand science, scientific papers. It's hard for them to understand um, things, know what testing to do. But but my my background in marine biology has allowed me to uh, under, help understand you know, understand the issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so r reading about this and kind of like through my own research, it's my understanding that the paper mill has been a huge part of this community. And I mean, there's talk about its pollution to the bay, but then also talk about how it's a staple in the community. And I was wondering, how do you think its presence has shaped the local culture here in the bay? It's, the paper mill is very important. I mean, it is the, at one point, it was, I think one of the primary Oh, I mean, it was, a, it was a primary industry uh, here in Pensacola. And, you know, before the paper mill, of course, there's the logging, the logging. And, and the, uh, I mean, you go back to the, well, 1860, I mean, up the Perdita River, which is just this way, um, you know, they log the southern, their southern pines. This tree right here. I mean, this was the tree they were, they were after, the southern, uh, you know, the, the southern pine. And um, the longleaf southern pine, and that's what this is. This is a secondary growth, I'm sure, but um, but this was they logged this whole area was logged 
at least twice or three times for this tree, the southern pine. And so, I mean, this area has an incredible history with this. You know, just down the bay, I don't know how you came, you can see pilings in the water. Well, there were six, six sawmills down there which uh, sawed up boards and sent them to the port of Pensacola. And, it, and the, by Pensacola in its heyday, which was, you know, 1890, 1880, I mean, this was the heyday of Pensacola. All that lumber from this area was shipped all over the world. And so this is a huge industry here. Um, tim timber, uh, logging, uh, this is this, you go downtown Pensacola and what do you see? You see the big, those big old houses that belong to the timber barons. <laughs> I mean, they were, there they are. But unfortunately, it, that was 30 years, they logged out the whole area and that was the end. Uh, and that was the end of the southern pine and then, so that's when they started to grow it. They began to grow, but not this, not the long leaf, but the other quicker, uh, faster growing pines. And uh, that's when they, sustainable forestry became a very important part of uh, the, this area's econo economy. I mean, it's very important. Yeah, I understand entirely why people want to keep the paper mill. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's been integral into the community. A lot of residents know it's there. Um, but in your opinion, do you believe that residents understand the toxicity that's associated with the paper mill? And, you know, how has this understanding impacted the community's action? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, they may they may understand it, and I'm sure some of the workers, a lot of the a lot of the workers at the mill, understand how polluting it is. I mean, I've talked to them several you know times, and they all understand. But it's their jobs. I mean, it's jobs. It's economic imp, import, you know, impacts community on this community, um, and and you know, so uh, the companies. Um, <laughs> The companies, well, I mean, they try, but they're not going to do that much. I mean, after all, this is, this is, this is, costs money to upgrade. And, 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 uh, and as a, a million of people have told us, I mean, this mill is huge and it's on this little bay. I mean, so they would never place a mill like that, that size. You know, today, they, that that wouldn't happen. But it was—it's been there since '42, 1942, and that's—that's uh, that's it. And so its its impact is especially noticeable, especially since they're the only ones. <laughs> besides, they're the only ones. They're the only industrial discharger in the bay, which has really kind of put them at a, a real disadvantage, uh, because you can't point your finger at the. Oh, it's that guy up there. Oh, it's this guy over here. I mean, this is very, very typical of uh, pollution problems. Oh, it's this, it's this industry is doing all the problems. And I say, well, we only have one. It's the paper mill. <laughs> so it's easy to know what the problem is, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. And so what kind of tension exists then between the desire to keep the mill open for jobs and the need to protect the environment within the community? Well, um, people, people, um, I would say that, I mean, we don't have a whole bit, a lot of support in the community. I mean, it's very, very little, very, very little. The only people that actually support us are the people that live on the Bay over here and in, you know, this side in Florida and in Alabama. Um, you know, I mean, people across town, they, they want to keep the paper mill, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't. And they didn't want it to dump into their bay over there in Escambia Bay. You know, at one point this was a big issue uh, back in 1999. Actually, when Bob Graham was senator, you know, they wanted uh, the the paper mill um, um, wanted to go over to Escambia Bay. And this was this was a very you know, and and the DEP under Virginia Weatherall and Bob Graham, um, they wanted. They, they wanted them to go over there because it's a bigger bay with other polluters. <laughs> I mean, they always point the finger to those other guys. But, uh, well, one, the other guys that are over there in Scambia Bay, which are chemical companies, they didn't want them. 
and and uh, and and the people over there, uh, you know, well, the Gulf Breeze, um, Pensacola Beach. They didn't they didn't want their area. They didn't want their beaches polluted or no. So here we have. The, this is what we got. <laughs> and they're just not. And as you can see, there's just not a whole lot of people up here. This is not a densely populated area. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So we're, you know, but people do never, never let support us. They're all, you know, there are a lot of, we have a group and we have a f friends of Perdido Bay and, you know, these people are all very adamant. They support us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could you tell us actually about Friends of Perdido Bay, your work with it and what's going on? And Well, um, yeah, it's, it started, uh, Friends of Perdido Bay started out in 1988. I think we incorporated um, at one point, there was uh, another group called the Perdita Bay Environmental Association, and um, that, you know, we we all we all were at in that group first. It was called the Perdita Bay Environmental Association, and then um, the paper mill, which was owned by Champion, came to us and said, "Well, you know, we we want to do the right thing." <laughs> We we got to do the right thing, okay? He said, okay, we'll do a study, a three-year study, and um, and you know, and then we had filed for an administrative hearing to block their permit back in 1986. So the paper mill came to us and said, well, we'll do this three-year study and see what you know what what shows up. And of course, we knew they were, you know, we knew it was a paper mill. We said, okay, we said, okay. And those of us that said, okay, we'll, we'll go with your study. We became friends of Perdido Bay. The other group, <laughs> the other group that didn't want, that didn't want to, to go with, the, you know, didn't trust the paper mill, didn't want to do any, have any study, didn't want to wait. They were still the uh, Perdido Bay Environmental Association. They went to a hearing and, um, in 1988, I think, and um, we, in, in, in the meantime, worked with the paper mill. We were, you know, we're okay, we'll work with you. Um, at the time, you know, we were naive about everything. Maybe, maybe still are. <laughs> and uh, so that was, Friends of Perdido Bay started in 1988 as a splinter, splinter group from the Perdido Bay Environmental Association. And then, you know, we just continued on. Uh, and people and people continued to pay their dues, um, and and so forth. It was, uh, it's important because people can see obviously that the DEP environment is not doing their job, right? <laughs> right. Thank you. And yeah. so, friends of Perito <clears throat> Bay, kind of who does that make up? It makes up. Um, most of our people, uh, well, they live in Florida and Alabama, um, but some actually have summer homes here, just have summer homes. Some live in Mississippi and other, uh, you know, their summer homes, especially the Lower Bay uh, and uh, Lower Bay but in Alabama, there's a lot of summer homes down there. And so this is who the people are. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so actually, you mentioned Alabama, as we saw, it's just... Just over there. <laughs> yeah, just down the bay. Um, have you, like, had to work with them on any project or, like, get their ear when it comes to cleaning up after the paper mill? Yeah, um, people, uh, you know, they, we, you know, we are an interstate bay. There's just no, 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 no doubt about it. Uh, the paper mills is permitted in Florida. But like we've always heard, you know, there's also a paper mill in Alabama. <laughs> so so um, we've been told, okay, if if Florida is hard on, on the paper mill, Florida, you know, doesn't, doesn't, if, if they clamp down on the paper mill, well then that, paper mill in Alabama, which is up in Bruton, does, dumps into a Scambia Bay, they're going to get it over there too. So it's, it's this tit for tat, <laughs> you know, Alabama and Florida, you know, they're not, nobody's going to touch their paper mills. <laughs> right. And 
Is there a particular achievement or a piece of work that got done in Friends of Perdido Bay that you're especially proud of or could reflect on for us? Well, it's just been a continuous effort. Uh, I think that that, uh, and, and our testing, you know, the, the dues that people send in were used for, are used for testing, which is very, very important because of obviously our environmental agencies aren't doing anything besides maybe taking a few water quality studies. And we've done studies which have showed the bay is still very bad. And we have done some studies that showed that the EPA has not helped at all. They have, I mean, since 19, well, the EPA approved this chemical in 1995. It's the bleaching chemical, chlorine dioxide. And may, amazingly enough, <laughs> Now, chlorine dioxide, dioxide, it's got two oxygens hanging on a chlorine. Got it? So what happens is that oxygens? Well, it helps to oxygenate the bay. And we didn't, it didn't happen until, of course, they got the conditions just right for this chlorine dioxide to happen. And I know we started doing studies in um, 2018, which showed, you know, there was very little oxygen on the bottom of Perdita Bay. Well, by 2021, we did studies that showed the Perdita Bay is absolutely super saturated with dissolved oxygen from top to bottom. Isn't that interesting? It happened. And it was, it was this, what? How can that be? I mean, we've got all this organic matter going in here. You know, the, we got years and years of studies that showed that this dissolved oxygen was low, especially on, you know, in the bottom. So how, did, how could a bay have super saturated dissolved oxygens from top to bottom. How? Well, it's this chemical, obviously. You know, it's this chlorine dioxide. And not only, but okay, so you look back at the chemistry of it, so we started looking at the chemistry. Wait a minute, this is odd. So you look at the chemistry and you see that this chlorine dioxide also produces a chemical called chlorate, which is a potent herbicide. And this, this well, that explained everything in the bay. I mean, we see no algae out there at all because, because of the chlorine, chlorine, chlor chlorate. It's chlorate, chlorate is the herbicide and it is part of the chemical reaction. And um, when, it's interesting because I was doing studies in the bay in 1995 when the, when the mill converted from chlorine, the bleaching, the chlorine dioxide and all of a sudden, I, I couldn't, I was growing algae on, the, on these glass plates, you know, to feed to my snails and um, snail studies. And all of a sudden, I couldn't get this algae to grow on these glass plates. I said, wait, wait a minute, something wrong here. So, yes, there was something wrong. We went up and we measured the stuff coming out of the creek where the paper mill discharged. And um, we found this, this chemical, chlorate and chlorine dioxide. And so we said, look, I mean, this is way back when, and I, so I, I alerted, immediately alerted the EPA about this chemical, because they were, they were, they let the whole paper industry convert to this bleaching chemical, because they said it was better for the environment because of the docks and problem. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is, this isn't, this isn't, uh, this is, this has got herbicidal characteristics. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are people at the University of Florida that know this too, you know, uh, they did some studies um, Odom, Howard Odoms had a, um, uh, had a student that did some studies on a wetland treatment that IP, or that Champion at the time did, and I'm sure they found that, yeah, this stuff, this stuff's herbicidal. So they're dumping herbicidal chemicals in the bay, and of course, eh, it's not good for the food chain. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. And that's, so that's one of the problems in the bay. And you can go down, there's no algae, nothing growing on the, on the posts. Uh, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> how, can you have, how can you have a healthy body of water? And the Gulf, how can you have a healthy Gulf of Mexico when, when there's no, um, when our bays are, 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 are killed like this? The productivity in the bay is, is silch. Yeah, I mean, because these bays are, the, are the, the areas where fish grow up, live, you know, shrimp 
shrimp come up here, uh, menhaden come up here and grow up, and then they go back in the Gulf to, uh, you know, to spawn or to live. And and if they don't make it, if they die up here, well, what kind of Gulf are we going to have? It's uh, very sad. If our bays are polluted, the Gulf of Mexico is not going to do well. Unfortunately, yeah. And there's so much money spent in fishing, and you see the boats running out on, on the weekends, these big fishing boats. Yeah, you see it all over. But, but if our bays are, are killed with herbicidal chemicals, the, the productivity is knocked out using herbicidal chemicals. Well, no. <laughs> yeah, pretty bad. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm I mean, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I diverge? No, no. Thank <laughs> okay. you. That, that is like so insightful and important for us yeah, to Yeah, and the EPA is, did it. And I'd say, I think maybe Bob Graham was even involved in that. Um, you know, this was way back in 95. And it was, yeah, Bill Clinton. Yeah, it was Carol Browner. You know who Carol Browner is. I'm sure she, Al Gore's, uh, um, she was secretary of DEP for a while. Yeah. I met her at UF. <laughs> she was, yeah, I mean, these people are responsible for this. But nobody's saying anything and nobody is, you know, that's it. Well, I mean, hearing, I mean, gosh, it's a, it's a lot to like take in and. It is. Yeah. It's shocking in a way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To know that your major environmental group, uh, EPA, would approve a chemical which I am sure they knew was going to have herbicidal effects on 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 the body of water into which it's discharged. Of course, Perdita Bay, you have to understand, is very small. I mean, it's very small compared to like, well, Scambia Bay or Pensacola Bay, which they're polluted too. Yeah, but <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well, in <clears throat> I mean, so it. It seems like the EPA has been complicit. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. It has been. Well, we're in like an election year, mm -hmm. and things are changing quickly. Do you have any thoughts about the EPA? Any hopes for? Well, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't think that the new president is going to uh, uh, promote any kind of environmental programs at all. Um, you know, when he was president before, he put a coal lobbyist as head of EPA. So, head of EPA. So, <laughs> what can we expect? Um, that's unfortunately our. Thank you. And so, I know there's been quite a few different lawsuits and legal action taken. Um, to combat what's being done in the Bay. Could you discuss, if you're comfortable with it, the lawsuits, the lawsuits related to the paper mill? What key issues have been involved? Yes, okay, uh, from my perspective. Now, this is my perspective, maybe not the perspective of others. Um, we've had, well, two major class action lawsuits in, in this um, in this bay. One was filed right when Bill Clinton became president in 1990, I think. And it was settled in 1994 or five. Uh, Champion, the um, owner Champion was in, they settled for $5 million. Now the attorneys usually get about 30% of that or 35. <laughs> they always get a nice amount for their trouble. And everybody on the bay got a couple thousand dollars. That was about what, what happened there. And there was no admission of anything, of any wrongdoing, you know, they didn't admit anything. Well, yeah, we'll give you five million and you can spread it around with you. So we took some of that money actually and, and some of the people donated it back. And we f actually formed a new, uh, another f foundation which again, we used, we used that money to test, to test and, and to do, but that money ran out, oh, I think about, it ran out in about five years or something.
But there was another lawsuit in, in 2005. Another lawsuit was filed. Not another class action. And it, it, it well, it kind of, uh, it started way back in 2000, more or less. You know, it kind of, uh, it was the attorneys were c flittering around among the group and, uh, and uh, yeah, and so it became a class action about 2004, 2005, 2006, it was, it was dismissed. And this is the thing that really irritates me. I mean, talk about corrupt attorneys. This was a, 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 a thing where both attorneys, both groups of attorneys, both the international paper attorneys and attorneys that work for the uh, Perdido Bay residents, and I was not a member of that class on then. I was actually an intervener. The attorneys from both groups said there was no class. They, they couldn't do a class action, but there was no class. And I have the stipulation that, that got rid of this lawsuit. It's on our website. It's on uh, friendsofperditobay.com. You got it? Yeah. That's the, 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 the stipulation, the 2006 stipulation. There it is. No, they, they didn't. Uh, they said there was no class. In other words, we didn't have a commonality. They have to have three. There's three things they have to have to have a class action. And uh, there was one, we didn't have common interests. Oh, we all had different interests. And, and the paper mill didn't pollute our beaches with any kind of toxic waste, blah, 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 blah. Well, that was nonsense. It went to, it went to the District Court of Appeals. They kicked, they said, yep, it's uh, sealed and done. Kicked out. It was dismissed. And it was after this lawsuit that International Paper, who had been making bleach paper, decided to go to uh, making liner board. And I think there was a whole lot of, whole lot of monkey business because I don't think they wanted to improve this mill, you know, upgrade it because they, they spent $40 million upgrading it to a liner board. Stop making bleach paper and started making this liner board, which started making them money because until, until they converted to this brown paper liner board, they were losing money in the bleach paper market. Okay, so they so they had to convert to uh, brown paper or brown liner board to continue to be, be to be profitable. Otherwise, that would have closed. <laughs> that would have closed long ago, right? So they spent the money based on I think the lawsuit. I mean, they because they actually got immunity. From then on, we didn't have a. a, a we didn't have any, anything, uh, we couldn't say anything about toxic waste, the stuff that they put out. We, you know, that was it. The lawsuit over, that was another <laughs> disappointing, that was very disappointing. Oh, and uh, did I tell you Levin was part of that? <laughs> and so was Robert Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, the Levin, that was the Levin firm. Uh -huh. Levin was part of that, and you know, the Levin Law School, yeah. He was part of that, except it was Mike Papantonio, his partner. Robert Kennedy Jr. and RDC, they were part of that too. Mm hmm. And they didn't, yeah, that was, that was pretty interesting. We just don't have much power. Nobody did anything about it either. <laughs> Nobody said a thing about it. How this was swept under the rug, this illegal thing where it said, oh yeah, they have no, no class. There was, nothing was done. So we were basically barred from filing any more lawsuits because of, the, uh, of that settlement. It was dismissed with prejudice, could bring that back up, and that was the end of it. Oh yeah, we've seen, we've seen some real, <laughs> real shady stuff here. And, and of course, a lot of it's because these people over in the other end of town wanted to keep their paper mill, wanted to keep their, their timber supplies and their, their timber business up. And you know, well, here we are. <laughs> Thank you for sharing about that. I mean, it seems like there's 
been different forms of actions, lawsuits, friend of, friends of Perdido Bay, but what would you say is the primary driving force for environmental advocacy for the Bay that keeps it going? Basically, because people want to see this Bay cleaned up. And we know who the problem, and we know, I mean, it's obvious there's only one, one pollute, major polluter in this Bay. And we know who it is, and they're still operating. And, I mean, what's even worse is they continue to, you know, they shut down one of their, uh, they shut down, supposedly this is what the DEP keeps telling us, they shut down their bleach plant, plant and they're only making now um, brown paper. One, there's only one, one line working. I don't know how much the paper is, but I mean, so has the bay gotten better? Yeah, you'd think, oh, well, we're, you know, they're making less paper now, and, you know, and uh, has the bay gotten better? We, we look for improvements. <laughs> no. Because why? Well, I discovered this a couple weeks ago. They're dumping their lime. Lime, that's calcium carbonate. They're getting rid of it, just dumping it out here. I mean, they have a wetland, you know, they're putting it out, and you can see, and you can kind of see it. And, I mean, this is, this is, this is terrible for the gills of the fish. Terrible for any, anything, a filter feeder, they're getting all this lime. So the studies that we did, the study that we did, we, we measured the Perdita River, which is of course the source of water for Perdita Bay. And I measured the water here right off my dock. I found that the calcium carbonate, which is lime, 50 times higher in Perdita Bay than, than, than in the Perdita River. Well, the river and, and the bay should be almost the same. Right? But no, they're dumping their, their lime. That's, that's calcium carbonate comes from the lime that they use. And it's expensive. I mean, it's ex well, it must be cheaper to dump it than it must be to uh, haul it. You know, they have to dredge this stuff out of the bottom and dry it and haul it to their landfill. I figure that's expensive. It's probably expensive. So it's cheaper just to let it go. Let it flow out. Right? Then have to then have to treat it and deal with it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so 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 we're not going to see many fish as long as we get a, a such a, we have such a uh, um, high you know high level of lime calcium carbonate. This this area has uh, uh, this area has acid. This area has acid water, acid soils. Uh, this is unlike Gainesville, which is uh, calcium carb. This is a you know limestone based. Uh, in in uh, Gainesville, you have all, you know, it's a limestone. That's what most of Florida is, limestone-based soils. Ours up here are, are a little different. They're acid. Um, the limestone is way deeper. Um, and so we have acid soils here. And, and all our rivers are acid. Everything is acid. But <laughs> we have a lot of lime being dumped in Bernita Bay. To, enough to... Uh, anyhow... It's just disgusting. And, there, and of course, there's no limit. There's no uh, limit on lime. Uh, calcium carbonate, well, that's good. I mean, you know, people think that's a good, uh, it's a good chemical, right? It's, um, I mean, it, it ties up the pollutants. It, it's a good, there's, so there's no limit on lime in, uh, or calcium carbonate in the rules. And only on pH, and I mean, there's a wide variety of pH. Um, from from what six to eight point five is the pH level here. <laughs> how can you how can you uh that's pretty pretty wide, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And they've made sure and it's the paper industry has made sure that this is this is the regs. You know, they're they're always promoting their own interest. Mm -hmm. Well I mean <clears throat> this has definitely been a long battle, a long time coming. Um what would justice look like for you personally with this situation? I hate to say it, the paper mill has to close. I mean, to me, uh, they're, they're, they're not going to clean up. I mean, I think we've, we've learned this. We've fought them. Uh, I mean, and I mean, I, I, can't, I can't blame them so much. You have to understand these corporations and are run by Wall Street. I mean, Vanguard owns you know, Vanguard, the, re in, in sh the re retirement company, they own a lot of the stock of, of IP. Um, 
Vanguard, BlackRock, and there's one other, or the, they call them institutional investors. They own most, well, most of the stock in IP. And so you can't expect these companies to say, yeah, spend $30 million to, to go. No, it's not going to happen. I mean, you have to be realistic about the, the way the, eh, that mill's going to have to just close. I hate to say it, unfortunately, um, it's too bad. Yeah. And looking ahead, do you have any specific hopes for the future of Perdido Bay? Yes, and surrounding it, community? it will immediately reco recover. They blew up in 2017. This is when they were uh, redoing their air permit and doing a lot of stuff. Um, they blew up and for three weeks, this, is, this was so fascinating to me. For three weeks, they weren't dumping in the bay. And it immediately recovered. I mean, immediately. It was two days later, we, we, we saw little fish down around our pilings. Uh, algae, algae started growing. It was so immediate. You know, people say, ah, oh, no, that, that bay's all polluted. It will never come. No, if you take the, the pollutant out, the bay will come back immediately. It came back immediately. Shrimp, we saw shrimp, fish, people were, all of a sudden we started seeing fishermen, you know, they, <laughs> fishermen know when there's fish. They came and they, and they were fishing, and the bay was a lot clearer, of course, than it is uh, right now. It's kind of opaque, wouldn't you say it's opaque? Yeah, it's, that's the calcium carbonate, but it was much clearer, you know, the bay was very clear. I mean, it, so I, I have high hopes, if they shut down, truly, it will come back. I mean, the bottom may be, the bottom may be a super fun site <laughs> for who knows how long. Um, you know, they just, in 2000, they just opened a, a new um, boat ramp just right down the beach here from me and dredged out the channel to the boat ramp. And we recently got the data. Now, they did this in 2018. They dredged out the data, I mean, the, the boat ramp. We got the data from the, the you know, stuff on the bottom, the sediments. Oh my God, they were, you know, barium, arsenic. It was just full of heavy metals. And, um, and I'm sure there's dioxin out there because we've measured it, it's been out there. And, um, but, so that stuff's there, but it's not in the water. <laughs> it's not in the water. That's the thing, it is not in the water. And I mean, maybe the calcium carbonate will help. It's, if it's in the bottom, it'll help it bind with it and it'll keep it from um, spreading and getting bad. Maybe the calcium carbonate is good in this sense, but uh, uh, but yeah, the bay is, the bottom is like bad. It's a super fun site probably, but, but see when the water, if the water clears up, the bay will come back immediately. Mm -hmm. That's my hope. We saw it. We actually, we had three weeks in 2017 with this magnificent bay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, this has been like such a great wealth of knowledge for us to learn from you and mm -hmm. the work you've done and the bay kind of jumping around for the sake of time. We could talk about this <laughs> all day, but I read that you'd mentioned you swam almost every day in 2015. Mm -hmm. What did that experience mean to you and how did it shape your relationship with the bay when you found out this isn't something I'll be able to do anymore? Well, it's beautiful. I mean, if you can imagine just floating around, looking out, you know, especially at sunset, it's just gorgeous to swim in the bay. You know, in the summer, it's so, I mean, the bay gets very warm. The water gets really hot in the bay, but it's so beautiful. I mean, just thinking, just swimming around and looking up at the sky and, you know, not being able to do this anymore was dis so disappointing. I'm kind of afraid, actually, to do it. I mean, I don't swim. As I said, about two years ago, I stopped swimming. Um, it just, you know, I'd come out, my skin would be stinging. Uh, I just, you know, you didn't know what it is. I, you, know, you just, my, my husband died from skin cancer, by the way. Um, he got a, got a skin cancer and it was a, yep. The same one that Jimmy Buffett died from, <laughs> Merkel cell. Is it interesting? Uh, we, every, all my kids said, "Did Jimmy Buffett swim in this bay?" He may have. This was Jimmy Buffett's. You know, 
Interesting enough, Jimmy Buffett grew up in Mobile and would come over here. And this was Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. This is, yeah, this was his beautiful place. But we never could get him to help us, uh, help us on the bay. I mean, we, we, we wrote to his, uh, his whoever, and they never answered us. We tried to go do a fundraiser and, because uh, this was his Margaritaville. Perdita Bay was his beautiful. It, it was beautiful. I mean, everybody will tell you who's grown up on the bay will tell you how gorgeous it is. It's a beautiful place, but it's unfortunately being used as a dump. Wow. How do you see this conflict playing out? Well, I see. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> maybe there's hope. You know, our new president <laughs> is going to Gonna, gonna, gonna put tariffs on stuff, and he's gonna um, devalue the dollar, and what's this gonna cause a lot of economic hardship? I'm sure. I mean, it's gonna affect all of you. It, I mean, it's gonna affect everybody. And maybe the economic they'll they'll just decide to close. <laughs> I hate to say. Well, well, environmental regulation didn't work, so maybe. They <laughs> Oh, the other part of it, well, the economic impact. <laughs> That's it. Really. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I hate to say it. I, I, I mean, what, we're, what my generation is leaving for all of you is horrible. I mean, and, and, and what you, you, don't you, you don't know how nice things can be. That's the horrible thing. I mean, I, I tell you about Miami. I, when I went, I went down to Miami and then to the Keys. You know, we spent a lot of time in the Keys when I was at Miami. And wow, well, what a beautiful place! That the coral was just gorgeous. This was this was 60 years ago, and today, you you people will never know how beautiful that that environment was. That is so sad. That is really sad. My children, well, some of them might know, but you, you will never know how beautiful that could be. That's sad, isn't it? We killed all that for, for what? If you think, <laughs> new cars, big trucks, who knows? <laughs> yeah, the consumer, the consumer society has tro totally killed, taken away your, your, your something that was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. All I have to say is I'm sorry because, because I'm part of the generation that uh, fostered this on all of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to my colleagues okay. for any lines of questions you guys may have. Hi, this is Hannah Boker. Um, I was just curious when you mentioned the Levin Law Firm being yeah. involved in the lawsuit and everything, were they representing the international paper mill? No, they were representing the, the uh, citizens on Perdita Bay. You know, they had uh, several, uh, the international paper mill had um, some attorneys from, I can't remember, New York. Um, the Levin Law Firm and uh, Robert Kennedy, the NRDC, they were representing the people on Perdita Bay, on the, the, um, the um, class members. You know, they have certain class members, uh, and they were the attorneys for, for the class members. Yeah, they, they were involved. Yes, they, unfortunately, the Levin Law Firm isn't exactly, uh, you know, right. Okay, that's yeah. very sorry, interesting. I'm sorry to tell Thank you that. Thank you, okay. <laughs> But you have to know these things. Things, uh, is cor corruption is a big uh, corruption. Um, politics, corruption, it's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Sophia. And um, my question is, well, first of all, you've brought such an insightful understanding to this interview as a steward of the environment, of the scientific process, and you, I really admire your ability to follow the money as you have throughout this story, <laughs> as well as speaking to the complicity, complicity of the EPA. A common theme we've seen this weekend is greed and greed's place 
in all of these histories. Is there any other party whose complicity you'd like to touch on during this interview? Well, greed is Wall Street, right? No, I mean, these people, I mean, they don't, it's everybody, you know, the vanguard, I mean, it's all part of the system. It's worked into the, the whole thing is worked into the system. Oh, I'm sure people that, that own Vanguard, I mean, my kids own it. I, well, I'm sure people, friends of Pretty Bay own it, members. But, I mean, they, they're not aware of, of, of the fact that uh, their money is causing the pollution of Perdita Bay, right? And I can't even blame the paper mill because, I mean, they are, uh, they have to keep their numbers up. You know, they have their workers to think about. Um, I bl actually, I do blame the Levin Law Firm. <laughs> they are, I mean, these are the people that actually knew what they were doing. Uh, the vanguards, the international papers, and that. It's the local, the local co corruption that really irritates me. Mm hmm That's, <laughs> yeah. And they were doing it, of course, for Pensacola. You have to understand, this is a big industry here. Huh? That's the way it is. I appreciate you sharing I'm sorry that. to, I'm sorry to, uh, yeah, well. Thank you. There, he put his money toward a law school. Uh, he's got his name on a, he's got his name on a law school there. University of Florida is a great school. I mean, and, and it's probably done, done some good, but yeah, you have to understand the basis of uh, where this money came from. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a little dirty money, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, hi, I'm Beckett Price. Hi. Um, I, you mentioned earlier in our interview the creek where the, the mill was dumping, and we read an article from the Florida Phoenix that I think uh, oh, yeah. is called Stink Creek. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us just a little bit more about that story? Yeah, um, who who was it that wrote that? Um, Greg Pittman. Greg Pittman. Yeah, he. Uh, we. I've talked to Greg so many times. Yeah, um, Greg's a great uh, journalist. Has written a lot of great stuff about Florida. Um, well, originally, that's where the paper mill discharged. It's the Stink Creek. That's the Eleven Mile Creek, and of course, you had this massive discharge. You know, thirty-five million gallons a day into this creek and it's it was probably the whole flow at the beginning and then you know, then more creeks came in and and it's yeah it was horrible i mean they the the process the craft process that you use uses a sodium sulfate and sulfur you know that rotten egg smell sulfur is that that rotten egg smell so this creek smelled like rotten eggs you know that same that same stuff and, and um, um, so, well, when we first challenged them in 1986, they were in Thin Creek. They were in Eleven Mile Creek. And of course, there was no way they were going to defend their, uh, their permit dumping in the creek. I mean, the dissolved oxygen was low. There's a lot of salts in the creek. I mean, this is a freshwater creek. A lot of salts in the creek. You know, there was hardly any, any fish or any life in the creek. So how were they ever going to get a permit? Well, this is when, this is when the DEP started promoting pipelines. <laughs> so they had to get out of the creek because, well, this was just, and this was in 1999, you had the DEP setting Pipelines, everybody's got to get a pipeline to a bigger body of water. And of course, uh, the, the pipeline that they were promoting was, they wanted to come to Perdita Bay, well, they wanted to come to Perdita Bay or going over to the other bay, uh, Escambia Bay, the pipeline. Uh, instead, they went to uh, a pipe, a 10 mile pipeline to a wetland discharge and they got out of the creek. Yeah. So it's no longer really Stint Creek. However, I mean, I could see this, this uh, coming down, uh, down, down the bay, and I don't, you can't see it, I don't think now. I don't, sometimes it's there, sometimes not. It, this uh, surface tension mm -hmm. of a certain flow is different, was different than 
the rest of the bay. And you could see this surface tension, this, this flow into, into the bay. And um, it looked like it was coming down 11 Mile Creek. And this is after they got out. I said, wait, wait a minute, this is weird. Why, why is this stuff coming down? You know, what is this stuff? So we went up there, started doing testing, and found that the pH of coming out of there was like eight. You know, it was very alkaline. It practically, you know, take your skin off your hands. So we also did a toxicity test in there in Sting Creek, which then it was really dark and black and foamy. And, and but when when they got out, it was really you know nice. It was kind of clear. But this water, and this was right after it came off the paper mill, you know, kind of flowed off the paper mill site. It was toxic. <laughs> it was toxic. We don't know what it, I mean, we never, did, we never did find out what it was that's toxic, but it was toxic. So they were putting something, you know, out, this, out the back door, out the back door, because they, they went to a wetland, and they have a 50 million gallon pipe that goes to a wetland and they discharge to the wetland. And yet, something's coming out of the creek. That's, <laughs> it's toxic, and I don't know to this day what it is. It was toxic. No, I, I did the same, and we took the, 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 water, the water that we took and sent off was, this was a, uh, University of Washington did, had this eco-analyst did the lab. I mean, they, it was a certified lab. We want to make sure we get all, all we want to make sure all our data is good. We use certified labs. I also took samples right here at my dock, and um, it was not toxic. So whatever it was that was in the creek water was toxic, and this stuff down here was not toxic. And um, even you know, even though I I think the water is not you know it's terrible and it's not good, but but anyhow, that's Stink Creek. It doesn't smell bad at all anymore. It looks good, but it's, it tends to be toxic. <laughs> toxic. Who knows why? They're, put, they're not supposed to put anything in that creek except storm water. And, and, you know, this was a time when there was no storms, nothing, you know, just toxic. Who knows? That's a good place to dump it if you, you know, if you have something you don't want to dump in your main thing because you got to do toxicity testing on your main, uh, on your main effluent. They all have to do toxicity testing. Yeah, you just dump it out the back door. It's unbelievable. So, I mean, what does DEP say about that? Well, they never answered that. that they never answered my... Uh, I, we send all this data. We send it all to the DEP. They get it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they comment on it. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> Our government is... Uh, it's underfunded. Let's face it. True. It's underfunded, and so... This, I mean, this is, the, this, this is where citizens... I hate to say that this is where citizens can really step up and make a difference. The private, I mean, we're private. This is private money. It's coming in and they, they, this stuff's toxic. You're not going to get a permit here. <laughs> uh -uh. This is toxic. And we will hire attorneys if we have to, to fight for this. Yeah, because you need attorneys, unfortunately, there. Big part of the Right. Uh, although we're barred now from, I mean, f f f we're barred from f filing lawsuits about, about toxic materials because that was because uh, of 11. <laughs> and Robert Kennedy, Jr. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Kind of opens your, opens your eyes to the way things work. We're just little people. Not many of us. Do you see many? There's no, no houses across the bay. I mean, and they just hoped we'd go, on, go away. People stopped making the annoying studies. <laughs> right? You can be a real pain in the neck. <laughs> that's right. So, that's where we are. <laughs> wow. That's, any, any other questions that's interesting? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. You can stay for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked a lot about how, like, the bigger corporations played a role in this, but what could us as, like, little people do to kind of combat these issues? Well, I'd say vote, except... 
<laughs> Except, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, it's to it's stay informed. That's about the best you can do. I mean, you know, it's, it's to stay informed. Um, I think because we don't have local papers anymore, you know, the, the local press is, I mean, we, we, have a, we have a local paper, but it's, it's nothing, it's nothing. And people just don't, can't, I mean, this, the demise of, you know, Greg Pittman knows this more than I think, the demise of the local new media is one of the worst things that ha happened to our, our country because you don't hear news and you can't, it's hard to stay informed. And you re, if you read that stuff on the internet, you may or you may not be informed, who knows? And so this is to, for, um, you know, the Phoenix, which is what he works for now, is, is a good, a good uh, thing because he, I mean, that's truly an environmental new, newspaper. But I mean, you know, we, we need more of these. Uh, this is, you know, and this is what, if you are a journalism major or anything, this is, uh, or, you know, anything, is to, to have, a, a, to inform people, this is why we have a newsletter, um, is the most important thing, because what I see is a lot of dumb people. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, oh my God, I see a lot of poorly informed, dumb people. <laughs> Sorry. That's my, that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. And this mm -hmm. was Caitlin Remmer, by the way. I've got just a few more little questions. From where we're situated right now, could you point to the location of the mill? Yes, I can I stand up? It's kind of right behind that palm tree there, <laughs> right there. Thank you. Um, and that's another interesting thing. We used to be able to look out. I used to be able to look out here and just uh, go up there and you could see the plume of smoke from the paper mill, the recovery furnace. You know, you could see it. Oh, it's just very, very, very visible. And sometimes I still can, but rarely. And I think, what's happened? I mean, where are they putting these chemicals that they used to recover in the recovery furnace? Well, I don't know. Yeah, that's the paper mill. It's right behind that palm tree. And you used to be able to see the smoke. It was very, very obvious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then looking around on the Friends of Perito Bay site, I saw there's rumors about buried treasure in the bay. <laughs> Can you share any stories or insights related to this? Well, you know, when the, when the pirates, uh, when the, uh, yeah, pirates came here, they couldn't get in the bay. Or sometimes they did get in the bay. And, and this is rumors, this is what you tell the kids. <laughs> Down there in the lower part of the bay, they ditched their booty somewhere, treasure, and they never could get back to get it. And so that's the buried treasure that's in, <laughs> that's in the, it's in the bay somewhere. It'd be down in the lower bay though, probably not up here. Um, oh yeah, up here, uh, it was practically fresh water. You know, opening the mouth, this is one of the things that, uh, um, that one of the researchers said, opening the mouth, a permanent opening of the mouth of the bay, kind of hurt it because it let all the salt water in. And so what you had was the layering of the salt water on the bottom and the fresh water on top. Until then, all right, the bay was practically fresh. There was no, no, uh, no salt water, only maybe on occasion. But there were, used to be water lilies. Somebody, some told us that there would be lot water lilies on the top of the, uh, of the bay because it was that fresh. That, yeah. And there were, used to be oysters too. I mean, sure, that, that's a good place for oysters. 
they, I used to ask them why there were never oysters, because well, of course we know why, because the lorry couldn't live up here. But um, I, I always ask them, well, you know, why don't we have oysters in Bernita Bay? They said, because there weren't any hard substrates. Well, if you go down here and look at it, you can see I got nothing but these groins in the water that my uh, father-in-law built, you know, 50, 50 years ago, and uh, there's plenty of hard substrates. <laughs> You know, it's crazy. Yeah, that's 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 the buried treasure story. Thank you. That's such a unique gem about this bay. <laughs> um, just as we're wrapping up here, is there anything else you would like to talk about that we didn't mention? I think we talked about it on everything. We, uh, yeah, we talked about the everything. I think if, if they would close, the bay would be gorgeous. Just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Although we do have a sewage treatment plant <laughs> up this way. We still, I mean, they, there is a sewage treatment plant, but where it's not at the same um, magnitude as the uh, paper mill. Well, thank you so much for your time speaking to us today and your commitment to the Bay. It's reflected in the community and it's it's greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you. you. Well, thank you. I'm, thank you for your, thank you for listening. Um, I am also writing a book, or I have written a book, it's being edited or trying to get it about, about this. Um, um, so it's called um, Skin in the Game. And hopefully it will come out. Maybe I'll even, uh, I, I wrote a book about a, about the history. It was showed up on Amazon, you know, the Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. And, uh, but I'm gonna try to get a publisher for this book because it's too much work getting out there and try to sell your books. <laughs> I mean, you gotta go to, you gotta go to, every, every day, every weekend, you gotta go to a fair to sell your books. But uh, anyhow, um, so I am gonna, I am gonna write a book about this, about the information. Um, it's going to be called Skin in the Game. So look for it, and uh, maybe I'll get the University of Florida Press to publish it. <laughs> I'm interested in this. Anyhow, yeah, that's right. And it's interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Well, thank you. I look forward to the book coming out, and I'll well, check you. out the one you wrote. Yeah, Yeah, thank well, you. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you can get it on, uh, it's called the... Uh, my first book's called Perdita Bay Blues, and it's on Kindle Direct Publishing, and it's about the history of, of our fight until about 2017, when of course the mill blew up, and we had all that <laughs> great water for three weeks, and uh, yeah. Anyhow, thank you for your interest. Good luck to you all. I, I was, and I must apologize to your generation because I, I don't. I mean, it's very sad what what we have done. But you're doing the good work. Well, I, I lived a good life. <laughs> can you, I mean, I have no, uh, no, uh, I mean, what else would I do, right? I've lived a good life. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm.